Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here, and welcome to the Daily Evolver. It is Wednesday, April 28th, 2021, and it's good to be with you. It's good to be with you live, and you can find all my stuff at dailyevolver.com. I wanted to start today with just a couple tidbits. One is just came over the wire by Andy Borowitz from The New Yorker, and it's regarding Biden going to deliver an address to the joint session of Congress tonight and pushing his social agenda, which includes uh, free preschool. And here's what Andy Borowitz wrote. Uh, he said, Dateline Washington, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, now she's the QAnon Congresswoman, lambasted President Biden's proposal for free preschool today by declaring, I refuse to go. Speaking to reporters, the Georgia Congresswoman called preschool just another form of mind control and said she would rather, quote, hold my breath till I turn blue than attend such a school. So we have heard from Marjorie. Okay. I wanted to also take a quick look at a line out of Tom Friedman's column in today's New York Times. And Tom Friedman is, I like him. He's, I think he's very proto-integral in many ways. He's a globalist and he's been writing for the New York Times for years. And he's always provocative, but here's where he falls down in my opinion. And as does the um, conventional wisdom in general. And I'll just read the line. He's talking about China's growing influence and the influence of these autocratic countries like China, Iran, and Russia. So he writes, China, Iran, and Russia are each deflecting the pressures of democracy and the need to deliver constant economic growth by offering their people aggressive hyper-nationalism instead. So instead of uh, giving them into the pressures of democracy and constant economic growth, they're offering their people aggressive hyper-nationalism instead. And I think Integral gives us a better look at that. The, the, the people are not blank slates, we know that. And it is not a matter of just what people are being offered up. People generally are being offered up what they want. And in these countries, I would say Iran probably excluded, but China and Russia, their leaders are popular. You know, these people want a nationalism, hyper-nationalism, maybe, especially in a country like China, where a billion of the people are traditionalists are earlier, really, in terms of development. So traditional cultures like Russia, like China, they, this is, you know, using spiral dynamics, it's blue, using integral theory, it's amber, but it's a stage, it's the God and country stage of development. They like big daddy leaders, they like order, they don't like multiculturalism, they don't like gender fluidity, or homosexuality, or any of the, you know, uh, modern values. And the reason is that, I want to say psychologically, but worldview-wise, developmentally, they're coming out of the red worldview. They're coming out of chaos. Democracy isn't appealing because it's based on compromise and shared power. And that doesn't really appeal to traditionalists. Traditionalists have the good and evil thing. You know, that's life is a battle between good and evil. And you don't compromise or share uh, power with evil, with the devil. You defeat the devil. And so these countries, you know, they're where they ought to be in the sense of they're where they are in the stage of development. And I think we have to um, factor that in. And I would love to hear from my listeners. I know there are quite a few in Russia and perhaps in China, I hear it from a couple occasionally, what you think about that and how you would, uh, what kind of an integral interpretation you might bring to 
what's going on in your countries. There's an article I wanted to highlight today that I, I think really gets to this. So this is an article that appeared in the New York Times a few months ago. And it's an article about this very issue as it is arising in another modern country, center of gravity, modern country, and that's Israel. And it's, uh, it's, it's titled, To Understand Red State America, he urges a look at red state Israel. And it's about this Israeli sociologist, his name is Professor Mizrachi. And he argues that Trump voters like Netanyahu supporters in Israel have legitimate reasons to find liberal values threatening. So when he's talking about Trump voters and he's talking about the, what's called the Mizrahim in Israel, and these are the working class voters, the Israeli Jews, roots in North Africa, the Middle East, they're the most conservative of the Jews politically. And like the Trump voters, they're the most conservative people here in the United States that, you know, integral helps us. These are traditionalists. Sometimes you have a center of gravity traditional country like Russia. Sometimes you have a center of gravity modern country like Israel and the U.S. with subcultures of traditional people. And so what I loved about this article is that he argues for the worldview not necessarily for the morality of the worldview, and I'll show it what, what I mean in a second. First, uh, here's a quote from uh, Professor Mizrachi. He says, it's really hard for liberals to imagine that their message, their vision itself, poses a threat to the core identity of other people. And then he describes liberalism's blind spots and this was published in the, a big newspaper in Israel a year ago. And as it says in this article from the New York Times, it shook the Israeli left like an ideological bunker busting bomb and could hold lessons for another deeply polarized society in the West. Uh, I wanna read some of what he wrote and some of what his thesis is. He says, the problem is not as some liberals contend, that the Jews of the Mediterranean or the Mizrahim are confused about what is best for them. They aren't suffering from Stockholm syndrome or false consciousness. What liberals fail to see, the professor asserts, is that working class Mizrahim are consciously spurning liberalism for a reason. What they see as the end game of the liberal worldview is not a world they wish to inhabit. And that's powerful. That is an integral view because you see that people are living, you know, we talk about different worldviews. I always love the term that Ken Wilber uses, world space. It's like these, this world of traditional, the world of modern, the world of postmodern, and indeed the emerging world of integral are radically different from each other in really interesting ways. He goes on, he says, traditionalists see themselves as their country's most patriotic citizens and demonize the left and its allies in the news media, academia, and other liberal redoubts as traitorous enemies. Both, he said, feel disdained by those elites who dismiss their views as racist, ignorant, or unwittingly self-defeating. And that is the view of liberals towards conservatives. It is. You keep ridiculing us and presenting us as undemocratic and dangerous, he said, articulating the non-liberal view, but we are the people. Who are you? And, um, you know, when we talk about liberal and conservative using the integral map, we're talking about green and we're talking about amber or um, uh, blue in spiral dynamics, green in both systems. And their um, monoperspectivalism in that they see their worldview as self-evidently self, uh, uh, real. And anybody who doesn't see that is deluded or worse, evil. 
Yeah. So um, here's a little more from the article. In 2011, Mizrachi heard a visiting lecturer from Europe extol human rights as the, quote, international moral language. And when he heard this idea of human rights as the international moral language, he had an aha moment. If such liberal ideas were so universal, he asked, why in Israel had they failed to reach the hearts and minds of working class people? He recalled demonstrations where liberal activists called for coexistence with the Palestinians and spoke of prosecuting both Israeli soldiers and Hezbollah fighters on war crimes charges. An expression of shared humanity that he said liberals found morally sublime, but which had onlooking Mizrahi taxi drivers boiling over with rage. For the, Mis for the Mizrahi working class, he said, the liberal vision of peace with the Palestinians, of breaking down barriers and prejudices between peoples, imperils their own sense of identity and belonging as Jews in a Jewish state. And um, the sense of belonging, he concluded, defeated every attempt by the left to make inroads with working class Mizrahim. And I would say that this is true for traditional people all over the world. You know, their sense of identity and belonging as, in this case, Jews in a Jewish state, Chinese, Russians, you know, the Russianness, Chineseness. These things are worth saving and noticing and not homogenizing into the multicultural blender. So we, you know, we 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 want to see the you know, we want to see the, the truth of these views. And so here's where the article goes. It, it talks about how he is critiqued from the left as legit, legitimizing discrimination and especially anti-Arab uh, bias among Mizrahim. And that he is defended by the central politician, Tahilia Friedman, and she says, it's always a problem with seeing the world in circles. First, my family, then my tribe, then my people, then, then other people. But that's the way most of us live. And that is a, just a statement of reality. I love that. Professor Mizrahi, she said, is trying to give respect to those sets of values which deserve respect. And that is the integral project, actually, to realize that people and, and children do it too as we, as we grow up. First my family, then my extended family, my tribe, then my people, then other people, nation, world, it keeps going. We move into, as we get into integral, we move into a cosmocentric worldview where we're identified not just with humanity as a whole, but with the animating energetic energetics of the entire cosmos. And that's another episode, but that's worth noting here. So, um, so the integral project is, as she said, trying to give respect to the sets of values within these worldviews that deserve respect. And that, you know, is the new integration. And here's how you do it. It's in, in it's almost deceptive in its simplicity. He says, understand the other side. <laughs> and, you know, I can't think of a theme of th this podcast that is, uh, you know, better put than that. And I'll read what he, he what they put wrote in the article. He said, uh, understanding the other side is a prerequisite to building the political gulf. When Professor Mizrachi was a visiting professor at Berkeley. A student confide, confided that she was having horrible fights with her mother, a Trump voter. He urged her to try to set aside her anger and interrogate her mother as if she were a research subject. It helped, he said. The other side's concerns are not mine, but they should be because I care about him or her, he said. 
we share something in common here. We are sharing this land and this nation. It sounds horrible, but he or she needs to become part of us because they are part of us. And yay, integral. That's a very integral statement. And um, so, here, here. So yeah, so I think I'll get into uh, another topic. It's very related, of course, and it is the current polarization that is going on in our country as the culture war continues to proceed. And polarization, again, as an integralist, I want to be friendly to it in the sense that uh, Evolution emerges through the process of differentiation and then integration. And we see that at every stage of evolution, including these subtle states of, of mind and worldview. And the worldviews have to become clear and differentiated before there's going to be an, an integration. And that is not pretty, it's not a pretty process, but it is the way of things. And I talk about that a lot, of course, on this podcast. And I often point out that there's the one way of seeing it and really operationalizing it in the US at least, is the struggle between the two storylines of America, the gratitude story and the grievance story. The gratitude story is the one I learned and most of us learned in school. It's certainly the old school story and it's the story of the pilgrims and the founding fathers and the manifest destiny. And yes, there was slavery, but we fought a war to eliminate it. Won two world wars against totalitarianism, a cold war, keeping the world safe, greatest country on earth. That's that story. And that's the story that was told exclusively for most of American history uh, until post-modernity came in. Uh, because postmodernity wants to deconstruct that story because it has triumphalist qualities that we've seen are dangerous. And we went out, grow them. We do, actually. So postmodernity comes in with the grievance story. And this is the story of the people who got the short end of the stick every step of the way the Native Americans, the enslaved Africans and their descendants who, you know, lag in almost every measure of social welfare to this day. The nations uh, we ravaged fighting proxy wars against Russia and China. The soft colonization of capitalism and materialism that has brought on a crisis of meaning and an impending eco, an impending eco apocalypse. And that's the grievance story. <laughs> and, you know, you can hear both those stories and notice that there's probably one that you magnetize to a little more than the other. And I do, I magnetize to the gratitude story because that's the one that has the deepest groove. I can see that. I don't necessarily have to go with it if I see it. If I see it instead of be it, I have some control. But yeah, I can see my magne magnetic pull to that story. But more and more, I feel the magnetic pull of the other story. And, you know, I really think that it's necessary to do that in order to move into a new integration. So I wanted to highlight a couple, uh, uh, well, actually one current issue that is going on in America, and this is the reckoning on race that continues, that was sparked by the George Floyd, now official murder, and the, the uh, conviction of Derek Chauvin, the cop who did it, and all of what has arisen from this. It's consciousness raising in real time. And, um, and, I, and, and what's interesting to me is how it has polarized even the black community. And that there is, a, you know, the, the, the grievance story is very much told in the black community, but so is the gratitude story. And I want to give an example of both of those 
that are up in this week's news. And, and then one that I think is actually an integrating um, uh, force. So uh, we'll start with a clip from Glenn Lowry. And Glenn Lowry is a very, very high profile, very popular black spokesperson for conservatism uh, uh, in um, uh, the National Review and, and conservative media. He's a, a MIT Harvard professor. He's a professor currently of social sciences at Brown, and I think is probably a walking testimonial for the power of tenure. <laughs> but um, uh, this is from, I'm, I'm just going to play it. It's a, from a podcast that he had with John McWhorter, who I, I think I brought up a week or so ago. John McWhorter is another conservative uh, African-American who has a new book coming out about the uh, critical race theory as a religion. And these two are very simpatico. You won't hear John, John McWhorter. If you're watching the video, you'll see him. But this is Glenn Lowry. So we black people with full citizenship and freedom and every opportunity in the richest country on most dynamic country on the planet, attracting the attention of people globally who want to be a part of it, and we have birthright citizenship here, are failing to measure up. The cops and crime and violence is one dimension of it. The absolute disorder and chaos in our family lives is another dimension of it. The failure to develop our intellectual potential so that we can perform and function effectively is another dimension of it. All we can do is go into a corner and throw a tantrum. And sadly, our leaders, including Barack Hussein Obama, are at the forefront of this disastrous course. The people who might actually alter the course lack the courage to do so. The, the people who are going to pay the cost of this are the black poor. They're the ones who can't read. They're the ones who are languishing in a jail somewhere because of their behavior. So I'm just absolutely furious with these people, their irresponsibility, their demagoguery, their cowardice. I'm furious with them, and they are leading us to hell. We're on the road to hell here. Now, is that traditional or what? We're on the road to hell here? Um, so yeah, that's uh, where all first tier memes actually think we're on the road to hell, but traditionalists really get that, you know, they have a real idea of that. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the gratitude story of America. That's the, there's a lot of uh, black Americans who are, do not buy into the grievance story. There's more of them than before, you know, the Trump increased his voter base among uh, African Americans. So he's a good spokesperson. And he's talking about the opportunities and just get on with it, you know, be part of modernity. Don't, you know, modernity is not thinking white. It's, you know, uh, checking the boxes and making things happen in the modern world. So that's Glenn Lowry. And on the other side, we have Ibram X. Kendi, who is the author of Anti-Racism and the real, you know, person who really brought that whole idea of, of anti-racism to the fore. And he wrote an article this week. I did unshare that, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. He wrote an article this week uh, that was in the Atlantic called Compliance Will Not Save My Body. And it is a, uh, about the police violence and so forth. And he talks about uh, the, the subhead is black and brown people's defiance is not the problem. Our compliance is not the solution. And so he writes in the Atlantic, he says, compliance will not save our lives. Compliance will not save us from being brutalized and debased like U.S. Army Second Lieutenant Karen Nazario was in Virginia. Even when we are forced into a compliant position, handcuffed and proned, a need like George Floyd was, incarcerated like Sandra Bland was, we may end up dead. Black and brown people are told in endless ways by fraternal orders of police and their powerful enablers, comply and survive. 
The defense attorney for Chauvin has said this in countless ways during his trial and will likely say it again during the closing statement. Floyd would have survived if he had complied. Deontay Wright, if he would have just complied. He was told he was under arrest, said Brian Peters, the executive director of Minnesota's largest police union. He set off a chain of events that unfortunately led to his death. And then Kendi goes on, he says, that is an old sentiment. Two centuries ago, enslaved people from the Southwest to the Southeast were given the same message by slaveholders and their powerful enablers. Quote, there should be a perfect understanding between the master and his slave, one South Carolina enslaver said in 1833. The slave should know that his master is to govern absolutely and he is to obey implicitly, that he is never for a moment to exercise his will or judgment in opposition to a positive order. Then again, and that's the, the end of the quote, and then Kendi goes on, he says, then again, the racist fear of the dangerous dark body governs as it has since the days of slavery. As divided as many conservatives, moderates, and liberals are on other matters, they remain largely united by their fear of roaming dark bodies and vulnerable to fear mongering by police officials or by former President Donald Trump when he said, without police, there is chaos. Which is true actually, by the way, but I go on. P complete, uh, a police compliance, this is Kendi, Police compliance with our humanity could be the solution, but I can't imagine the institution of American policing ever recognizing Breonna Taylor's human rights, Eric Garner's cries to breathe, or the life that a Latino seventh grader has to live. Police officers do risk their lives, but do I risk my life every time I pull over for an armed police officer? when I don't have my documents in my hand on the steering wheel and I comply and reach for them, an officer could shoot me dead like one did Philandro Castile. Compliance is not a lifesaver. When I comply completely, I feel lucky to survive police encounters. To believe otherwise is to comply with an alternative history, with a fantasy land, with wishful thinking, with an American dream that is my American nightmare. And that is the grievance story, by God, that is the grievance story. And to believe otherwise is to comply with an alternative history. So, you know, th there's people in the integral world um, talk about, um, you know, is wokeism green? Or is it red or is it amber? Blue is a traditional itself in the sense of good and evil. Uh, is, you know, is it modern, postmodern, whatever it is. And it's all of those. I mean, woke can be expressed at every stage. It, 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 read, it read, it's like, fuck this fucking place. You know, I, 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 my relatives, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, we live in this shithole neighborhood, it's crime, you know, fuck it, you know, bust out the windows and bring it down, burn it down. That's red. You know, let my people go is red. That's a more positive vision of it. The blue is um, what we just read there with Kendi. It's like... Um, a, it, it's, it's a new kind of good and evil. And it, it, it casts, in this case, the police as, you know, really malign, malignant forces in the lives of black people, which it's, as an integralist, I want to see that that is, you know, it's, it's like all worldviews. They have an exoteric story of how the world is, and they have an esoteric story where they actually transmit something that's true. And, you know, it's, I think of Christianity as a, as a classic example. You know, if, 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 you, if you, you want to become an a Orthodox Christian, you have to agree with the creed that says that Jesus is the son of God and he was sent here to 
assuage our sins and he was uh, crucified and came back in three days and sits at the right hand of God. And that's the es esoteric or the exoteric truth. The esoteric truth is that you are seen and loved by a creator God. <laughs> and that may be true uh, or, you know, something like that. Uh, but, um, and, and so here's where, you know, if, if you look at um, what Kendi said about uh, when I comply completely, I feel lucky to survive complete uh, police encounters. Uh, I can't imagine American police uh, policing ever recognizing Breonna Taylor's human rights, the life a seventh grader has to live. I don't know. I, that, I, I don't think that holds up to uh, facts. Uh, but it, 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 and here's a, actually a, a column in today's uh, Wall Street Journal by Jason Riley, another black columnist, conservative. And he talks about the story that is told, the woke story about police and dark bodies and all that sort of thing. And he, he um, says, police killings of African-Americans declined by 60 to 80% from the late 60s to the early 2000s and re have remained at this level ever since. So that's the, more of the gratitude progress story. According to a Washington Post database, police shot and killed 999 people in 2019, including 424 whites and 252 blacks. 12 of the black victims were un un unarmed versus 26 of the white victims. In a country where annual arrests number more than 10 million, if those black death totals constitute an epidemic of police use of lethal force lethal force against blacks, then the word has lost all meaning. Uh, so 22, what do you say here? 20, uh, 12 black victims unarmed in one year. So, you know, uh, that is a factual argument. Welcome to the culture wars, people. These truths are really alive and really energizing people. And I wanted to, you know, argue for Kendi's uh, transmission of an esoteric truth, which is that, and, and, and he actually did it overtly, you know, he brought in slavery and the echoes of slavery and, and other places in the article, he went through Jim Crow and other things. And that that is still here, you know, that that is still online. And I think I've used this example before, but it's been very helpful for me in understanding and making room for the grievance story, which again, I don't naturally gravitate to. And it's using the example that is, uh, it, it comes out of couples therapy. And if there is one person in a couple, say it's the husband who drinks too much and he cheats and he hits the wife and mistreats the kids and they all endure it and live through it. And then one day he has an awakening and he, you know, maybe he gets religion or whatever and he becomes a good guy. And so for the next 20 years, he's a good guy, but there is a, a, a resentment. He can never quite break through with his wife like they were, or with the kids, they keep them at arm's length. They don't trust them. And, you know, his argument is, I haven't done anything to you for 20 years. And the, the principle in couples therapy that really takes people to the next level is that he has to understand and she has to know that he understands how badly he hurt them. And he has to look her in the eye and she has to see that he gets it. And if she does, then there's some hope for a new relationship arising and forgiveness. And that's the process we're going, that's going on. That, that's what Kendi, even though, you know, his exoteric teachings, you know, great gall my liver, his esoteric teachings have a very important piece of the truth that is very animating for some percentage of the population. And a lot of my liberal friends, uh, a lot of people are, you know, I'm getting it in terms of, you know, consciousness being raised. And some people 
you know, it, it, it's a very, very compelling story. It really brings them, you know, every stage of development that we move into feels like a new liberation, a new world, a new understanding of things. And this is what is happening here with this story. And, um, you know, we have to make room for it because it's true. You know, it's not literally true, but it's uh, esoterically true. The transmission is true. And I want to um, end with a, some words from a African-American who I think gets it and transmits it beautifully, gets both stories and, tr and has transmitted them beautifully. And it is uh, Barack Obama. And I'm going to quote from his famous speech that he gave, I believe it was in 2008 when he was running for president the first time. And there was the controversy about his preacher, Jeremiah Wright, who had, uh, there was some uh, video of him surfaced where he talked about God damn America from the pulpit. He said, they want us to sing God bless America. No, 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 God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating our citizens as less than human. God damn America for as long as she acts like she is God and she is supreme. And then he talked about the attack from 9-11 was America's chickens coming home to roost. And, you know, this is anathema to the gratitude story. And um, the people weren't ready for it. They sort of blew the doors open and Obama had to do something. And he delivered his you know, one, one of his many, many integral speeches and integral writings. The guy is as integral as they come, in my opinion. Uh, and so here's what he said, and I'm going to read three paragraphs. He said, the remarks made by Reverend Wright that have caused this recent firestorm weren't simply controversial. They weren't simply a religious leader's efforts to speak out against perceived injustice. Instead, they expressed a profoundly distorted view of this country, a view that sees white racism as endemic and that elevates what is wrong with America above all that we know is right with America. I love that. He goes on. He says, understanding this reality requires a reminder of how we have arrived at this point. As William Faulkner once wrote, the past isn't dead and buried. In fact, it isn't even past. Bingo, this is that you know, karmic reality, this matrix of cause and effect through time that we have to deal with. It's part of our you know, interiority. We do not, this is Obama. We do not need to recite here the history of racial injustice in this country, but we do need to remind ourselves that so many of the disparities that exist between the African-American community and the larger American community today can be traced directly to inequalities passed on from an earlier generation that suffered under the brutal legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. Right on. Segregated schools were and are inferior schools. We still haven't fixed them 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education. And the inferior education they provided then and now helps explain the pervasive achievement gap between today's black and white students. Legalized discrimination where blacks were prevented often through violence from owning property or loans were not granted to African-American business owners or black homeowners could not access FHA mortgages or blacks were excluded from unions or the police force or the fire department meant that black families could not amass any meaningful wealth to bequeath to future generations. This history helps explain the wealth and income gap between blacks and whites and the concentrated pockets of poverty that persist in so many of today's urban and rural communities. A lack of economic opportunity among black men and the shame and frustration that comes from not being able to provide for one's family contributed to the erosion of black families. 
a problem that welfare policies for many years may have worsened. That's an you know, interesting, that's a conservative critique of the war on poverty, the welfare po policies that uh, worsened the family conditions because it didn't um, reward marriage and rewarded not being married actually. And he goes on, and the lack of basic services in so many urban black neighborhoods, parks for kids to play in, police walking the beat, regular garbage pickup, building code enforcement, all help create a cycle of violence, blight and neglect that continues to haunt us. And that is true. So we wanna have room for both those stories. And we wanna have room for people who believe one or the other, because that's where we're at in this um, you know, evolution of consciousness and culture. So that's what we try to point out here. And that's what I got for today and the world will keep turning. So uh, thank you for uh, listening or watching The Daily Evolver. See you next time.